So, starting in verse 9, let's just, uh, let's just read this, and then I'm, I'm going to kind of set our, set our anchor for where we're going to go. So, verse 9, it says, um, uh, Because of the suffering, I'm going to start kind of in the middle of the verse, uh, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. I will put my trust in him, and again behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So we're going to be looking this time at um, Jesus, the, the founder of our salvation and the defeater of death. So um, it's going to be about death tonight. And uh, I don't know what your experiences with that have been. I think all of us in the room are old enough to have lost somebody in our life who we love. Um, so, I, you know, I don't mean to, to start off on a morbid, sad, emotional point, but somebody have a story that they would, wouldn't mind sharing with us of a time when death came and touched you in some way, some loved one and it left a mark, or some... Some, somebody in your family, some close friend, and, and your experience with having had death pass by you. Anybody uh, feel comfortable sharing that story here as we begin? I know it's something that, you know, it's not, it's not polite coffee talk. Say it again. Is there a, a story of when death has come by in your family or your circle of friends that... that it was a profound moment, you know. Maybe we have a great uncle or somebody who died and we got a letter about it. We're like, oh, I miss Carl. But it's not that big of a deal. But maybe there was something in your, somebody close to you and, and that it rocked you when that, when that person yeah, passed. I yeah. I, uh, I think it was like uh, early 2000s. And uh, I was supposed to go on a mission. We were going down to Puerto Rico. And it was just a normal training mission. And something happened, I think it was with Julie's dad. And I got pulled off of the crew, and uh, that crew deployed without me. They picked up another co-pilot, and uh, they ended up crashing into a mountain. They lost the whole crew, and uh, you know, that was for me. That was eye-opening. Thinking, wow, I could have been a part of that. And again, I mean, it was crew error that caused the plane to crash. So there's you know, part of me that hopes that maybe I could have done something, but then. I'm really just grateful that, wow, it's not my family that's missing, you know, and I know that sounds selfish, but, um, no, that's real. And so, thinking about the crew, the, uh, the aircraft commander was a friend of mine, the, and the co-pilot and I went through initial together, but the one that hit home the worst was the, uh, the engineer was on his last mission, this what we call it a finny flight, and, uh, Usually they're good deals. At the time we were doing desert rotations a lot, so a break going to Puerto Rico was seen as a pretty good deal. And this guy spent like, I think it was 29 years in the Air Force. Wow. Was married, had three daughters, and all three of them were in high school. And uh, so that, that one, you know, hit home. And we, oh we lost, you know, a couple other crews over the years, but that one to me, was the closest to home in that, that was actually, you know, I was on that crew. Wow. When actually a plane went down about six weeks before that. Yeah. 
and the um, the one that went down six weeks before that a bunch of us wives went to the funeral of the two people that died on that plane. Not everybody on that plane died. And the lady that drove all of us wives to that funeral, her husband was on the second plane. Oh my gosh. Six weeks later. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So yeah, he had uh, two young, young kids. So, wow. Yeah, so. Wow. Yeah. So death is an enemy. And when you hear a story like that and and I'm sure we all have times when death visited us and our families and our friends. And Death is an enemy. Death is not part of the design. right? When at the end of Genesis 1, God looked down at creation and said it is very good. Death was not a part of that picture. And um, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that when, when God goes about wrapping up this creation, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that's kind of, that's the coup de grace, right? That's the, that's the big deal. Destruction at the end of wrapping up this world and bringing about the next. And um, Jesus has, has pioneered the destruction of death before us. And we get to walk in his train. And we get to, we get to go down the road that he's already walked for us. And, it, you know, Again, I, I'm not a military guy, and tons of you are, so I'm, I'm sorry that I borrow your analogies. Um, but, but the position of a scout, of somebody who goes first and looks at the trail and makes sure that the main camp of people coming after them are safe, that guy has the biggest risk, and that guy has the, takes the biggest um, potential for injury. And when he is done, then hopefully the rest of the people have a sense of assurance as they walk down the road behind the first people, the pioneers, the scouts, that there is, there is safety, at least some degree of it, because it's been checked out, the route's clear, we can go. Um, in the Bible, death is sometimes seen uh, as a valley, and I, I, the, the most famous of those is in Psalm 23. And um, Jesus is, is, in our passage, pictured as the, the pioneer of our faith. The ESV that I read said founder, um, and the word there is archagos, and that, that can mean two things. It can mean ruler. You could, you could call a king or a, or a duke or a lord or something an archagos, and it can also mean the pioneer, the first one to go there. Um, same word has two meanings, pioneer and ruler. Um, quite often because the person who is first on the scene, who establishes a work, winds up governing it. Um, and Jesus is both of those for our salvation. He is the, the pioneer of our faith. He was the first to go down the valley of death and make the trail safe for the rest of us. And he is the one who has defeated the, up until that moment, reigning Lord of, over death and has taken that, um, and has defeated the enemy in their place. Um, so he is the Lord and the ruler and the pioneer of our salvation. Um, and this text talks a lot about death, and so it may feel kind of morbid, but it's, by the end it will be good, um, because the story doesn't leave off with death being an enemy that we need to be afraid of. Um, so Jesus walked through the dark valley of death before us and took its horror upon himself. He has defeated the enemy that lies in wait there. He routed out the thieves and the robbers along the trail. He crushed the head of their captain. And that valley no longer holds the terror for the believer that it once did. Death is now a passageway to communion with God. There is still a valley... And there is still a shadow. When people die, very few people buy, buy party blowers, right? But the, there is no longer a fear for the Christian who walks through that valley that he will lose at the end, right? So that's where we are now. Just for context of the metaphor I'm going to keep using tonight, I do want to flip to Psalm 23 real quick. So let's go to Psalm 23. And if I could have... Uh, Somebody volunteer to read that out for us. It's a short psalm. We're going to read the whole thing. Thank you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before my enemies, in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right. All right. One of the more famous psalms, frequently read at believers' funerals, um, because the valley is the shadow of death. But death doesn't live there anymore, right? Not for the believer. Death is not sitting there at the end of the trail, haunting the trail and making it a place where we go to die a second time. There's still a shadow there. It's not a good time. But it is. Um, it, it no longer has the terror that it once did. Notice the Lord here, Jesus, um, he has gone before us and he leads me in the paths, right? He knows the paths. He's gone there before you. He doesn't have to experience the paths along with you. He's not walking through your life and wondering what's next. He doesn't hope that it will all come out right. The churches that teach that are heretics. There are churches, sadly, that teach that Jesus is experiencing time along with us and hopes it all comes out at the end. Um, that's not the Jesus I worship, and that's not the Jesus of the Bible. He knows the paths. He's been there first. He's defeated the enemy along the side. He's marked the trail. He's declared it safe. And he walks before us. And then notice he comes back and he walks with us, right? He leads us in the paths. And then when I get through the valley, I'm not afraid because he's with me. So the scout has gone before and defeated the enemy along the way. And then he comes back and he says, okay, it's safe. Let me show you where to walk. Let me show you where I've defeated the enemy. Let me take you through the safe path. So he is our pioneer, and he is our shepherd. He's defeated the enemy, and he's with us as we go. And that's kind of the two focuses of Hebrews 2, is he is the, the, the founder prince, and he's our brother. So Jesus goes through the grave first as the founder prince and defeats the enemy. And then in our experience, we get to live with him as our elder brother who lives life next to us and alongside of us. I don't have an elder brother. I don't have a younger brother. I'm an only child, so I don't get to live this analogy. But, but I have two kids, and there are numerous times when the older child shows the younger child what to do. Most of the time for good, sometimes, sometimes for ill. Um, but, but there is a lot of, I am the older, let me show you what to do. And uh, Hebrews 2 paints two pictures for us here. Jesus is the prince founder, and Jesus is the older brother. So he's defeated the enemy, and then he comes back as the older brother, as the shepherd, and walks us through. Let's go ahead and go back to Hebrews 2. It's interesting that in verse 9, it says that Jesus, by the grace of God, suffered death that he might taste death for everyone. What comes to mind when you hear that Jesus tasted death? What does it mean to taste something? To experience it, right? He experienced it in full. Right. It was, yeah, I mean, he, the, all the pain and, and the suffering and the loss, sense of loss and everything he experienced while he was hanging on the cross. Yeah, yeah. When, when I think of tasting with food, has anybody been to... Uh, a cheese tasting or a wine tasting or a something tasting and you don't get much of it there, right? If you go to, a, if you go to some kind of dessert tasting or wine tasting or whatever tasting, you get this little serving. You're supposed to, you know, mmm, mmm, yummy and, and put it down and then, ooh, thank you, mmm, great, and set it down and then you go have a burger because you're still hungry, right? Um, that's not the sense of what Jesus did for us. Jesus didn't taste death in the sense that he had a near-death experience. You know, somebody close to him died and he was sad. With the word here, tasted, I, I'm sorry that it came across in the English tasted. And all the, Engl all the English translations I looked at this week said tasted. And that's a bummer because a tasting is like, a, mm, I've sampled that. Um, the word here can mean I've sampled that, but it can also mean you partake, you consume, 
It has to do with eating food, right? So it's much better to say, like, he chowed down on death, but that doesn't come across as poetically as he tasted death for us. He consumed death as a meal. It went in him. And when food goes in, it becomes part of you, right? It's, it's, it's an experience you don't undo. I can't uneat the two gyros that I just ate. I love the gyros. I'm glad I ate two of them. But if I later regret and wish I'd only had one, I cannot remove from my body the second gyro, right? Not easily. Not well. I could, but... Yeah, yeah, but... But I give it enough time, right? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Bad analogy. That just failed. One way or the other. <laughs> but but what? That's the idea that I'm getting to with Jesus is when he, when he came against death, it wasn't a light experience. It wasn't wasn't a momentary affliction. It wasn't a scary brush with death. Um, he went to death in, in completely. He died all the way. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, the, the picture, the picture of what Jesus su- suffered in terms of consuming death. What, what happened on the cross that would illustrate the depth to which Jesus suffered human death? Can you can you think about that? What happened on the cross? Think about the time of his crucifixion and what occurred on the cross. Other than the physical pain which was extreme given what he went through. Why have you forsaken me? me? Exactly. Because because not only was he suffering physically, but he was suffering the emotional and spiritual aspects of... Because what is death? Death is separation from God. And that's what death really ultimately is, and he experienced even that. Um, So he, he did... He took it all. And the second, the second thing... Remember when Lazarus was died? The, the shortest. How would? How? What did Jesus? What was? What was going around? All around Lazarus. All uh, mourning. Lots of mourning and women wailing. Mm-hmm. And he waited. He waited mm-hmm. to the period. So everybody knew he was dead. There was no way mm-hmm. for the guy to come back. This guy is dead. Mm-hmm. Well, what did he do and when he saw all that? Oh, he, he wept. wept. He wept. Which I think was in line also to what you said that the original design yeah. was never the intent of, right. of, of death. It was always it's just the eternity. Right. You know, and that's why we had that tree of life. But mm-hmm. um, but to see them all and to recognize that that was not my design. Right. And, you, and I, I think it had to also uh, you know that word like my I hope it moved them also mm-hmm. uh, to see them all just just in, in that wailing mode. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not that gentle. So we right. That we do right. The it's a real, yeah. you know, emotional. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. In- interesting thing is that God, the creator of the universe, man chooses to walk away from him and, and has to suffer the penalty of death, and then God Himself chooses to suffer that same penalty mm-hmm. on our behalf. Mm-hmm. Right. The taste of death that came about because of our rebellion. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about the picture of Abraham. Um, you know, the, the animals that are cut in half. It's only God that goes through it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and when we talk about him consuming uh, death and it going into him, there's a, a running picture in Scripture, um, not of food, but of drink, of the, cu- the cup of the wrath of Almighty God. And several times in the Old Testament, God talks about wrath being stored up in a cup. And a cup of wrath shows up five or six times in Old Testament prophecy. Um, and, and if you follow those through, which we're not going to do because of time tonight, but if you follow those references through the Old Testament, you get the picture that this cup is getting more and more full. That as the sin of mankind is going on, the cup's volume is growing. Right? And, it's, and it, is, it is getting to be a larger drink as the wrath of God for sin is being filled up. And then in, um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus um, asks, if it's at all possible, asks the Father to let this cup pass from me. Right? And so if you follow that analogy through, this cup has been, fill, has been filled up for thousands of years with the wrath that is rightly due on sin. And then 
Jesus is served that cup. Um, and he sees the cup before him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, that's what drives him to the emotional prayer that he has for hours with the Father. If there's any other way, let's, do, let's take plan B if that exists. I don't want to drink this cup, right? Um, and then in, uh, in John 18, before that scene, um, people tell him, hey, don't go to Jerusalem. They're trying to arrest you. And he says, what, the cup that the Father has prepared for me, will I not drink it? So again, there's the sense that this cup of wrath is there. And metaphorically, he's going to drink the full measure of the wrath of God. And when he suffers death, it's interesting to compare his emotions going to the cross with other people facing their death and ask why was it so different for him as a man. So he suffers death, and a horrible death. Nobody wants to be crucified. It's the most torturous, terrible way to, be, to die right? But he spends hours the night before begging God for another plan and then submits himself to God's will and goes through with it. Peter is crucified as well. And if you read the historical account of Peter's crucifixion, um, there is no begging God not to do this to him, right? He, he considers it an honor Matter of fact, he considers, it, he considers himself not worthy of the honor, and so he asks to be crucified upside down. Um, and then the other apostles um, uh, all die a martyr's death. And if you read the stories of their death, none of them beg for mercy. None of them spend time praying that God would not let them be martyred. They all bravely, courageously walk right into it. Um, I teach church, church history at the school, and over and over and over again, there are examples of people bravely facing a, ma- a martyr's death. Um, uh, one of them that comes to mind immediately is, is, uh, is um, Polycarp, who knows he's going to be martyred, stands on trial the last, the last time as the people are asking him, will you renounce Christ or will you, will you go forward and, and be killed? And Polycarp says, Christ hasn't wronged me in 80-something years of being his servant. Why would I wrong him now? And Polycarp walks himself to the execution stake. Um, various people in that story have those kinds of courage before they die. And then we look at Jesus. And obviously this, the reason that Jesus goes through the emotional trial is not that he's less of a man than Peter. right? He is the perfect man. So let's not say that he's emotionally fragile or he's scared more than anybody else is. Can somebody think of why is it that so many other Christian martyrs faith face death with courage and embrace it without giving their torturers the benefit of their begging for life. And Jesus begs God not to do this. Well, somebody hazard a guess. Why is Jesus so emotionally opposed to what he's about to do and other martyrs have courage in the moment? Yeah. I'll take a shot. Because he doesn't deserve it. He was perfect. He was God. He didn't sin, so there was no sense of wanting, I mean, of him to be crucified. But you know, the Father told him to it, so he submitted. Right. Uh, because of the Father's will, not because of what he wanted. It was the Father's will. Compared to others, uh, like the other folks, you know, they they see what you, they know they're sinner and they didn't know what Jesus did for them, so they willfully um, do it freely, mm-hmm. you know, give themselves up. Okay. Good. Yeah. Anybody else have another idea? Yeah. So becoming sin itself, he's a holy God. Right. And, has, and, 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 and hates sin. And then I'm, I'm wondering, I've often wondered if he knew he was going to be um, that division from the Father, I mean, because mm-hmm. he loved the Father. And um, I don't know if you've ever, um, my father died when I was 19, and knowing that I can't get to see him again for, until I, till I die, it, it, it was really rough that first year going, I was looking forward to coming home and going, oh, I forgot, he's just not there. Mm-hmm. I was really making plans, and then I realized, he's not going to be there. Right. So I kind of always, I always wondered, the fact that he knew that he would be forsaken, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I, 
face of separation from God, where the martyrs knew that you know this is this is the way to be with God right. for eternity. Right. And I don't I don't know. I mean, did that give them the bravery? Mm -hmm. You know, the courage not to playing or yelling mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they knew what, where they were going, mm -hmm. where death was defeated mm -hmm. beforehand with Christ. Mm -hmm. Where Christ, you know, we talked about last week where he was a man, he had the Holy Spirit, he had the Holy Spirit in full measure, right. but uh, he was still a man. Right. Uh, and he had right. to take this up and he knew what was coming at him. Right. It was very, and he, just not our own sin, everybody. Right. So, right. The key, right. So in the Bible, it talks about two deaths. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Because in Isaiah 54, it talks about for a brief moment I was with you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face with you for a moment. For the everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord of the But I was thinking about the other one where he talked about that you would go through the river, uh, the river I think, and you don't get wet. Um, you go through the fire and you don't get sent. Right. So you know that he's with you. The martyrs of Stephen is, is sees of the Father in the in the midst of coming to you. Right. But he doesn't. Right. He, he's right. Alone. Right. Yeah. The Bible talks about two deaths. Right. The first death and the second death. That the first death is our is our mortal flesh, and the second death. Is the, is the final damnation of lost souls at the end, at, at the, the great white throne judgment at the end of time, right? And so um, nobody yet has died twice. Everybody who has died has died once. And there are, there are those in heaven awaiting for the, the final balancing of the books, and there are those in hell waiting for the final balancing of the books. But the second death, the lake of fire, the forever torment, has not begun yet as it will. Nobody has yet faced both deaths. Sadly, many people will yet face the second death. Um, but Jesus, Jesus faced both deaths simultaneously. Because he went from the cross to hell, according to 1 Peter. And there he warred with and overcame Satan. And so he is the only one who has faced both deaths. And he's really the only one who knows what the second death is. Nobody else who, is, who has died on this side of the first death can comprehend the second death that is waiting for them. Right? Right? they had an inkling of it, they wouldn't be facing it. <laughs> um, and so Jesus, is, Jesus went to both deaths at one time. So you could say his death at that moment was the greatest death that has ever been. Because he went straight from the torment of the cross and the physical death to defeat the second death, right? And then the rest of us uh, who will die in Christ or have died in Christ, there is no second death. And we know that. And we have confidence in that, right? It's not from the Bible, but it's true. Born twice, die once. Born once, die twice, right? And, and so we who have our faith and confidence in Christ know that he has blazed the trail through the valley of death. And he is now coming back for us. He has been the founder prince. And now he is coming back to be the elder brother and to walk us through the path and say, don't worry about it. I've, I've run out all the thieves. I've run out all the robbers. I've defeated the enemy that owned this valley. Let me show you where to walk. And the valley ends in the presence of God. So we have the first death and we know that there is no second death. And so that can make one martyr say to the other things like, play the man for an hour and we will then rejoice with Christ. That's a, that's a quote when one martyr said to another martyr as they were both walking to the stake in Scotland. They were about to be, being, about to be burned for not being Catholics. And one said to the other, play the man for an hour, and then we'll be in the presence of God. Right? Because it's, that's all it's going to take. Um, and they know there's only one death. 
Christ knew there were two. And he knew he was going to go to both at the same time. So it is, it's a much higher level of pain and torment and anxiety um, for him than anybody else in history. Trevor, you raised your hand. What were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that um, yes, we, nobody has experienced uh, the fire death, second death. But Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. In the right. Bible. right. And you can get a very clear description right. of how bad it is, which should be discouraging enough yeah. for men not to want to experience that. Right. Uh, which is why many places in the scripture it talks about the worship God with trembling and fear. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily because he's going to throw you in hell, but because he's reverent and deserves that. Right. And you don't want to be, well, Hebrew, we're eating Hebrews, is a terrible, terrible thing. Right. To fall into the hands of a living God. Right. You don't want to be uh, separated from God. Right. Uh, totally true. Because that's forever and ever. Right. Right. Let's go to verse 10. It says, It was fitting that he, that's God the Father, for whom and by whom are all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, that's us, should make the founder, and there's that word, the archagos, the, the founder prince, of their salvation, perfect through suffering. I'm going to stop on a couple of words there. Fitting. The word seemly is, is another parallel for that. Or appropriate. Um... You might even say lovely, although that seems out of place in this sentence. It, it was appropriate. It was fitting. It was seemly that God should make Christ suffer. Let that ruminate in your head and your heart for a minute. It's proper and fitting and comely and lovely that Jesus suffer. Doesn't that seem wrong to you? I have children. And I discipline my children. And discipline is unpleasant. But there is never a moment where I would say it is lovely and fitting and comely and appropriate that you are tormented right now. No. That kind of father goes to jail. Yeah. Right? So, what, what comes up in your hearts when you think about it is fitting and lovely and appropriate that Jesus suffer. Yeah. Well, what comes up is, because I know it's not in the Bible, but what comes up is that, uh, look, this is the amount of payment that was required for what Adam did. Because this is the payment that Satan received for what he did. It's eternal separation. It's the that's why the death was there. That's what God said. And because a man did it, another man has to sacrifice and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only way mm -hmm. that he was ever, I was going to have a place in heaven. Right. That was, and he was willing to do that for me. Right. I think we can all personalize that particular statement. Right. If I was the only, I heard this one time eight years ago where our other church the pastor said, you know that if you were the only one that had sinned against the Lord, and everybody else, there was no other man but you, Jesus still would have came and did that. Yeah. yeah. That's the mind blower. Yeah. Yeah. Because it would have paid the wage for one. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he did for all. In Isaiah 53.10, Isaiah 53 is, is, um, is Jews in the future looking back at Jews in the past and saying, oy vey, why didn't we get it? That's Isaiah 53, right? Um, Jews in the future looking back at Messiah and wondering why Jews of that time didn't understand. That's the setting there. And, and part of Isaiah, part of their future confession will be that it pleased the Lord to crush him. And that falls into that same thing here. It, it pleased the Father to crush Jesus. And then in Jesus' own words, in um, Matthew 26, 24, Jesus says, The Son of Man goes the way it has been written of him. 
but woe to him by whom he is betrayed. So Judas isn't off the hook just because it was pro- prophecy. Judas, Judas is in for a world of hurt. Um, but he, Jesus still was going to do what the plan was, right? This was the plan. This was not the fallback. This was not the, if it doesn't work out. This was the plan. Um, and Revelation 13.8 says that Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Right? So, before the foundation of the world, that means, talk about the love of God. That means that when God said, let us make man in our image, he already knew that, that's, that this man would fall. And this man would need a savior. And that the second member of the Trinity would need to pay that price. Right? The lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So, this was God's will. And then we ask the question well, why would he choose this? If this is God's will, why have this be your will? Right? I mean, you're God. God is not constrained by anything but his own character. Um, And so God's holiness and God's righteousness and God's justice required this sort of situation. And God's love required Christ's sacrifice. And God's glory required that his love and greatness be put on display. And for the sake of time, we're not going to look at all the references, but um, you could go to Romans 3.25 and 26 and see that God declares... His glory to the angels and to the watching world by His salvation of man and by His walking through this this process, right? It's about magnifying His glory along with validating His justice and His love and His mercy all at the same time. Um, Romans 5.8 says that we don't deserve it, that, that God did this for us before we loved Him, that while we were still His enemies... He died for us, right? Um, That his love could be magnified. Um, He did it to to teach us what love is. 1 John 4.10 says, says this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, right? And he sent his son as a propitiation for sin. And so he did it to teach us what is love. Um, And uh, to bring himself more glory. John 21.19 again, along with Romans 3, 25 and 28, clarifies that while we massively benefit by the action, it is not really for us. It is still for God. God's justice is inviolable. His holiness is inviolable. His love is unmeasurable. And His glory is magnified when these three attributes of Him work themselves out on the cross. Um, His glory is made greater. So... um, I'll put, put those references up in the notes, so if you want to look those up and make sure I'm telling the truth, you can. But this is, a, yeah, this is a plan that God had before we existed. And the plan required the sacrifice of His Son to demonstrate to all of creation the fullness of the greatness of the glory of God, right? Blows your mind. Blows your mind. So, uh, and then in this verse, this is that, that word, the founder, ruler, the prince founder of our faith. He goes before us and defeats death as the pioneer and then walks back through the valley, leading us along the way as our elder brother. Talks about bringing many sons to glory, that's us. We're going to focus on the son and brother and child pictures of this next week. For right now, I'm just going to keep going. Um, and then there's this, this thing that Christ should be made perfect through suffering. That bugged me all week. I only, I only got happy with that phrase yesterday. Um, that Christ should be made perfect through suffering. What's wrong with the first brush of what that means? What's wrong with the first, the first sense of what you get from those words? That Christ has to be made perfect through suffering. Yeah. Jesus does not need a new and improved version. Right? He's immutable. He can't change. Jesus can't get better. Right? He can't change. To get better would be to change. God is immutable. Jesus is God. Jesus is the same. 
Jesus' physical body was born and learned and grew in attributes and got bigger and developed, but the essence of who Jesus is as the second member of the Trinity did not ever change. So, so what do we do with this? That Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Someone take a shot. Oh, hi. While some will take your word for it, it's another thing entirely to toss it into the most, you know, unimaginable circumstances and still have it come out well, you know, come out well on the other side. There's like proof of its perfectness, mm-hmm. and and then it's, it's kind of hard to just like, well, of course Jesus was perfect. He never went through anything. Right. Of course he was perfect. He, he lived life without any problems. Of course he was perfect. Yeah. He came out with this little thing he did now. Right. Right. Made perfect is almost like proof to others of like he went through just about everything he did. Right. Of course, now he, he lives to the perfection that he he exudes. He right. Is right. Perfect. And that was that's that's great. That's that's where I landed. I went through several attempts to make this make sense to me. Um, one of which was trying to find text textual variants in the manuscripts that would allow me to apply the word made perfect to the sacrifice instead of to Jesus, because that I would understand, mm-hmm. that he perfected his sacrifice, that then I would understand it. So I looked up, you know, what are the manuscript tec- uh, variances on there, and is there somewhere that it says that the perfection can apply to the suffering? Nope. It's always applying to Jesus. Um, but the word, the word there um, is uh, teleio, and tele is a common Greek prefix, common Greek root word, and we use tela in our English as well. What what sorts of things have tela in it? What what English words have the word tela, T-E-L-E, in it? Television, telephone, telescope. So all of those things have to do with what? Yeah, no... Yeah, something something not where you are, right? So, um, a telescope helps you see a long ways away. A telephone lets you make noise a long ways away. A television lets you see something that's happening potentially a long ways away, right? Tele has to do with way, 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 way over there. That's what it has to do with. So, the sense is that he completed his task. And... And Jesus uses this word one time as recorded in the Gospels. He uses it of himself, and so it's very helpful. Go with me to Luke 13.32. This is the verse that made me happy yesterday. Luke 13.32. Uh. Uh, yes, but I want to pick up a little before that. Let's see, I'll start at verse 31. Somebody? Okay, I got it. Okay. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached him to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to see And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and form cures today as tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Okay, so there it is. That's the exact same word, teleo. And so it, it can mean to perfect something, meaning I have gotten it to the end of its improvement. That's, that's the sense in which you can use the word perfect. But here, Christ uses this word of himself, and the sense is, three days from now, I will have finished my course. I'll be at the end. This is three days before his crucifixion. So, when the author of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses that word of Christ, it means the same thing. That, that the end of Christ's course, the end of his journey, was this pioneering through the valley of death. And it was suffering and death that brought Christ to the completion of his mission. And it's, an un- it's unfortunate that the translators decided to go with the sense of perfection as to the... the 
as opposed to the sense of completion, because completion makes a lot more sense to me. He had a job to do, and it was through suffering and death that he uh, finished his job, that he's done with it. Yeah, right, right, and that's it's the same root word. Um, it's the same root word in John. Da, 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 I wrote it down. Um, same root word in John 19:30, when Christ says it is finished. It's a different con- conjugation of the verb, so it's not teleoi. It's or teleo. It's it's telostomai. Um, but it's the same same root word um, that I've I'm done with it now. It's all over, right? Go ahead. Yeah, because the lotion in, in Greek is behind, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Goes, yeah. Like a, it's all done, the yeah. point in time, yep, yep. Uh, the word is used also one other time to help us understand it in Philippians 3.12, so just so I'm, I feel like I've made sense of this for you, go there with me too, Philippians 3.12. Here it's used in the negative. Here it's used in the negative. So, not having been completed. Okay? In Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. There it is. But I press on to make, my, to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead... I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So here, Paul is saying, I have not yet finished my journey. I have not yet brought myself to completion. So I still have somewhere to go. I still have a journey and a road ahead of me. There's still process in my future. And so Paul is giving us a negative example of it here. I am not, I am not completed. My journey is not done. I still have to push forward. And Jesus says, in three days I will be completed. And then on the cross he says, it is completed. And then Hebrews author looks back and says, it was the completion of the task um, through suffering that, that, that Jesus experienced. Right. So when you read that, don't think that Jesus got better on the cross. Jesus has always been God. Um, there, are, there are heretics who teach that Jesus... Um, Jesus was exalted to the status of God because of his sacrifice on the cross. That he was, um, he was a honored man that was filled with the Holy Spirit, lived and taught with the power of God, did miracles with the power of God, and demonstrated his worthiness to be divine by going through the passion. Those people are wrong, Okay. But this is actually one of the verses that they will build their faulty argument on, is that Jesus was perfected by suffering. That it's this that earned him the right to sit as God enthroned in heaven. So, wrong. Not true. This is the end of his journey, not the improvement of himself. When they, when they make those arguments, I mean, do they really look at the word in Greek? I mean, or they, or they just are looking at an English word and that's how they're basing all this stuff? i got to think that you can't be a good student of Scripture and wind up with that idea. Yeah. 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 Um, so some of this was formulated. I mean, the folks, a lot of these controversies of the nature of Christ, and I'm sure you know this, were formulating uh, shortly after he left. Yeah. And, and it was before the gospel had really been, had been uh, assembled and the letters were still in circulation. Right. And some of it, like John, for example, was written to address some of the controversies of his day, Gnosticism, Gnosticism, yeah. and things like that. So mm-hmm. so there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, all the things we struggle with today in terms of heresies and cults and stuff like that, all of it was back there in his time. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to skip for tonight uh, verses 11, 12, and 13 just because they deal with the second major theme of this section that I'm going to get to next week. So we're going to go down to verse 14. Um It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through his death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So, um, again, just sitting on a couple of words as we go through this. Share, the children share in flesh and blood. The word is koinoneo, and koinoneo 
is used a lot of the times for many different senses in the New Testament, one of which is just fellowship. Let's have, let's have sharing together. We do that as we eat, right? And let's koinonia together. Um, and, but it can also mean common, um, like we have it all in common, or it can be found everywhere. Um, and when it's used in the sense of it's common, like it can be found everywhere, like the blue cups are currently common in the room, right? That is in opposition to something that is holy. Holy means set apart and unique and special and over there on the shelf, right? And koinonio would mean you can find it everywhere. Um, so I think both senses of the word apply here. We share a common flesh and blood. We all have it. And Jesus took that upon himself as he walked through the valley of death for the first time and defeated the enemy, right? He did that with our, our flesh on. But also... Um, common as opposed to holy. Our flesh and blood is fallen. And um, it is also true that Jesus took on fallen flesh, right? To walk through the valley dressed in that. He himself was not sinful, but scripture says that he appeared in the appearance of sinful flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, right? Um, and, uh, and so he himself was not sinful, but he was wearing a sinner's disguise. Um, he was wearing our flesh as he went and did that. Um, so both senses of koinonio um, apply there. Yeah? You can't be found. What are you going to say? No, you were. All right, really, really. <laughs> 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 Did we going to say something? Anyway, perfect as a perfection as he was already perfect as God. He was right. Done perfect as God. Right. But it was also for the bigger picture so that we would be like that. Movie. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, yep. That's yep. Weird. But I love the verse when you just read the verse. I don't know if everybody jumped out at anybody, but there, since therefore since the children right. came to save the children. Right. Yep. So that's, that's like the all. Of, yep. That should fill everybody's heart. Right? right. And that's where we're going to get. That's the. No, that, okay. no, that's the whole theme of next yeah. of next week. We're going to look at all the children <laughs> analogy here. So that's good. Yeah. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> Notice that he went through death. Right. Um, It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing that through death he might destroy the one who was the power of death. He went through it, right? It was not an air campaign. He did not fly above the valley of death and drop bombs on it. This was a ground invasion. He had boots on the ground through the valley of death and he went door to door to defeat the enemy, right? He, he, He got dirty. He was in it. He went through death. He did not go above death. He did not speak death away. Um, he went through death and experienced the death for us. Um, uh, verse, um, yeah, verse 15. Um, he went through death that he might destroy the one who is the power of death, that is, the devil. So the devil, the devil has power in death. Why does the devil have power in death? Help me with that, theologically speaking. Okay. What? Where in the Bible do you go to for death is the result of sin? For the wages of sin is death. There you go. Romans six twenty three. That's the easy one. Absolutely. Anything else? What else comes to your mind that sin and death need to be tied together in your mind? Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. Yep. Genesis 3, when the fall happens, death comes around, right? People start to die. Immediately, God kills an animal to make skins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, right? Death follows immediately after the curse. Um, But is it true that the power of death rests solely in the hands of Satan? So so how does that work? It wasn't Satan. Okay. However, the, the actual whole concept of death didn't exist until the fall of Satan. Right. That's when death, nothing died before that. Right. You right. Know what I mean? Because of his rebellion, 
this extreme rebellion, and I remember you probably did on that, yeah. how bad that was. Because of his extreme rebellion, death was, came about. Right. So anybody who follows after him automatically gets the same fate. Right. Right. I have a question. What is the opposite of trust? Don't say distrust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Untrust. Untrust. <laughs> or mistrust. Fear. Doubt. Mistrust. Doubt. Doubt. Doubt or fear. 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 And so, you know, part of the, I, my opinion is, part of the devil's hold on death, if you will, is manipulating the fear of death, mm -hmm. causing not, causing people not to trust in God and not to, uh, under, you know, understand, not to be willing to follow Christ uh, through the valley of death. Because, you know, a lot of Christians, um, had they fallen prey to the fear that the devil maintains on hold, they would have not have gone to the, to the um, they would have denied Christ and, and avoided the, the uh, uh, torments that they were put through, mm -hmm. but they did not. The devil, the devil, did not have a hold on them in terms of fearing death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think another aspect of that is that um, the fear becomes so great that it's the elephant in the room. Like you know, death is the thing that you know most people in the world seem like they try to deny it. It's so big and bad, and they can't think about it because they don't have hope. If they're not a believer, they don't want to think about it, and they're just trying to not think about it. Or it's forced upon them for some reason, right. family or on themselves, you know, for the moment. And, yeah. you know, it's like it's the same point. concept, but no, that's you know, a good how point. subtle he is, yeah. like, going to think it's so bad, I can't yeah. even deal with it. Fear causes them to, the fear of it causes them to ignore it. And then, you know, they're not yeah. addressing my eternity, right. like, well, should I believe in God, or what does the Bible say, because mm -hmm. they're in denial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice fear, by the way. So, so Deuteronomy thirty two thirty nine, um, Deuteronomy thirty two thirty nine, God says that He is the Lord of life and death. He kills and He makes alive again. So, the power of death still resides in the hand of Almighty God. Satan has been given a domain in which to operate. It's his uh, death is his zone. But he is not Lord of that, right? He is, he is, the, uh, he is the one who, who uses death as a manipulative tool. But, but he does not ultimately hold the power of death. Um, Deuteronomy 32, again, 39, very clear. Psalm uh, 93, also very clear um, that, that God kills and God makes alive. The power of life and death is in God. Um, and if you look at the, the analogy or the, the, the story of what happened with Job, um, the right to kill resided with God the Father, and he, he allowed Satan to kill um, Job's family, but that happened under the permission and the oversight of God. And God spared the life of Job, and Satan was powerless to go against that. So the power for life and death still resides with, with God the Father, Satan uses death as his tool. It is his, it is his zone of influence. It is, it is what he works with, but it is not his by right. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, we can also remember Abraham with regards to Isaac. Yeah. Abraham was able to demonstrate that self as well. Yeah. That he was Lord ultimately. Right. When he asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Right. But he was able to. Right, exactly true. So yeah, then it gets into the concept of the fear of death. Um, to deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Fear of death um, still wigs out lots of Christians. Um, I, I remember, and my parents watched these videos, so, sorry mom. I remember um, my mom took me to the top of the Eiffel Tower as a young man, I think I was nine or ten years old. And she said, you know, Eiffel Tower promises can never be broken. And I said, what? She said, yeah, promises you make at the top of the Eiffel Tower are sacred and can never be broken. And I said, okay. And she said, promise me you'll never jeopardize your life or do something stupid. 
And I said, okay, sure, what are you going to do? Yeah, you can't leave. Your mom is the only way you're going to get down from the top of the Eiffel Tower. And, and yes, I took it seriously, but I can't tell you how many times, like, mom, I'm going to become a scuba diver. There is in people's lives. So I'm almost done here. Um, the fear of death uh, has been destroyed so that we don't have to live in slavery, Right? We don't have to live in slavery. We don't have to be afraid. And it's not, it's not a bad thing to make off the tower promises. It's not a bad thing to wear your seatbelt in the car. It's not a bad thing to make sure that you don't take stupid risks with your life. But you don't have to be so mortified of death that you don't live. Right? Because eventually death's going to happen. And when it does, if you know Christ, you will walk through that strange transition. You'll walk through the shadow, but your elder brother will be with you. And at the end of the valley, you will get to be in perfect communion with Christ. So, so there is no sense of mortal fear of death. There is a shadow. It's weird. But it is not something that we need to be in slavery about. Okay? Um, so the rest of this passage deals with child, brother, son imagery. And we'll get to that next week. Um, are there any final questions or thoughts or reflections about Jesus and death? Yeah. Uh, one one scripture that always sticks with me that Jesus said if you if you save your life you'll lose it and if you lose your life you'll save it right and he I, he always reminds me that when I'm in situations where I have to make a decision on um, for example like Christians who go into places and they're dealing with sick people sometimes with communicable diseases right but they choose to go there like uh, the uh, I call her sister Teresa but Mother yeah. Teresa she lived with lepers. You know, she was willing to embrace them. And that's what Jesus demands of his people. He said, you know, don't be so concerned about, you know, sustaining the high life. Right. You have to be willing to give of yourself, the right. sacrifice of yourself to minister to people. Right. I mean, yeah, Trevor, going, yeah, going to minister to the people with Ebola. Yeah. 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 And just dealing with Trevor often is a sacrifice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Any, any other, any other maybe maybe less less uh, confrontational uh, observations. You'll get me back. All right, all right. Thanks. Let's. Uh,